Hey guys, it's Callus here to bring you the Callus Invitational 7 Play-Ins Magma Bracket Semi-Finals between Lax and Darth Tyros. Unfortunately, I have to start this video off with a bit of a negative disclaimer. As some of you may have noticed, this video was originally recorded live at the time the match happened with both Jabba and I commentating, and I even uploaded that video, but it was quickly brought to my attention that... Due to an error on my part, I recorded that video with the wrong program in a rush, that the audio that Jabba was contributing was not picked up whatsoever, so it was just me talking, and then when Jabba was talking, as far as the video was concerned, it was just silence. That obviously is not going to be an acceptable quality for this tournament, so I'm going to re-record these, but unfortunately in this case... Unlike in most matches that I narrate, I did, I do know the outcome of these. I have seen these games before, so I'm not going to pretend that things are taking me by surprise or whatever. I know what happens, but I still want to bring you these games. Uh, they are well worth watching, but unfortunately, like I said, you can only see it live once. We tried to do that. A mistake was made, and this is where we are. So I apologize about that. I also apologize to Jabba for inadvertently wasting the 45 minutes or whatever it was of his time to record the video in the first place. Gonna obviously try to not let that happen again. But in the meantime, for those of you who have not seen this game, these games, which I'm sure quite a few of you fall into that category, there is an entertaining series here to see for sure. And I'm excited to bring it to you guys. So let's get into the action. It is Lax and Darth Tyros who beat Zern and Luthier, respectively. And the winner here, and this is the first match to be played, so we don't know. But the winner here is going to face the yet-to-be-determined winner of Kalum and Sadly Seas. So here we go. So Lax is going to be on the bottom and Tyros is on the top. Flygon is an unusual lead, but I'm not overly surprised that there's a Magneton in the back. That's a pretty common pairing with a physical Mon that really can't get through Skarmory the way that Flygon is. Skarmory lead, I mean, Darth Tyros using Skarmory at all is not really his MO as an in general. And then having it as a lead indicates usually like a Jolt Spike Stack or some kind of very aggressive team that really really wants to establish the spike early on because you can see he's got at least i mean regardless of the other three in the back he's got at least a t-tar which is a poke that obviously can lead and often does lead so if he's choosing to lead skarmory over t-tar it's got to be for a reason and there's got to be some level of urgency to get the spikes down as far as tyros is concerned so clearly an offensive squad from him as he's firing hp fires into his counterpart uh, looks like the kind of team that Fredazi likes to use, and the two of them were teammates for, I think, two years in a row. Maybe it was just the one, but it was at least one, maybe two, in Mushi League on the Whoopers, Whoopers. And I would not be surprised if between that and perhaps private conversations, what have you, Tyros picked up on some teams or was just given them directly from Fredazi. Kind of an old school team from Lax here. Something that I think is interesting about this choice into Tyros, this is pretty far opposite of what I would bring if I were trying to counter-team Tyros as usual, which is generally, I mean, when you think of Tyros, stereotypically, he's very much a special offense spammer, but to his credit, uh, he's only played two games before this, of course, but in those games, in the previous round, he really switched it up and didn't play special offense either time, and this certainly is not a special offense either. So Tyros is either thinking that he's going to be too predictable if he does that, or he's trying to make a point and prove something to us that he can play other things as well. I'm surprised with the second earthquake that Lax allowed that to happen. He had a free switch into Skarm or Flygon there, and Arrow is presumably locked on the EQ with Choice Ban. But he decides to let the tar go instead. I, I think that's probably a mistake. Uh, maybe he thought that switching to one of those things was too obvious. So Tyros was definitely going to switch himself. And therefore Lax had an opportunity to attack. But Tyros just did the obvious thing and just clicked EQ. Just attack what's in front of you. And he's going to lose the T-Tar. 
But yeah, what's really weird about this choice for lax, like I said, this is like very, very far from what I would generally bring uh, if I were trying to counter team Tyros. And this team actually looks very vulnerable to Tyros's preferences. This team looks like it would get run over by a special offense. The only thing even close to a special wall is the Celebi, and that's nowhere near enough. If you brought something along the lines of the ABR CM spam team, or really any remotely well-built CM spam team, I think Lax would get bulldozed over. So it's interesting that not only does he bring a team so vulnerable to what Tyros normally does, but additionally, Tyros, a complete 180, this team is very, very far from his norm as well. That being said, we have a fairly close game. Uh, the three layers of spikes that Lax managed to get down, and you can see that Tyros is bringing neither a Magneton nor a Rapid Spinner. Those layers obviously are relevant here. He does have two pokes out of his five remaining that are immune, and he has half of his team that's immune to begin with, so he's not obscenely spikes vulnerable. Uh, but Tyros' team is also very vulnerable from the special side. The only thing remotely close to a special wall is the Celebi, which itself is Spikes Vulnerable, and as we discussed in the reverse, would not be enough if Lax had brought something to the effect of a dedicated special spam, which obviously he didn't either. Uh, Aerodactyl certainly is a Mon that helps out in that matchup. Uh, it scares away Super B, Super Rachi, Raikou, things that are commonly found on special offense teams. So the dynamic that we're left with is pretty far from what most people would have expected. I think as a whole, Lax is not going to be doing a lot of counter-teaming. I think that he is just going to be worrying about himself rather than his opponent in these play-ins. And I think he's just going to try to bring generically solid teams that aren't overly samey game-to-game and try to avoid being predictable. Uh, whereas Tyros, I think, is way more conscientious about that. And like I said, I'm not clear if the goal is to prove a point and shut people up who are trying to pigeonhole him into being a one-dimensional player, or if it's more that he's really, really paranoid about being counter-teamed. But the way that the bracket fell, the way that the luck of the draw has gone for him in a play-ins that is full to the brim with Mushi Leaguers, who are all familiar with him and all know that he's a special spammer, as it happened, he's gotten two opponents in a row who are among the few in the pool that are not Mushi League players and maybe aren't as familiar with him and aren't as inclined to try to counter-team him. Luthier and Lax are both not ADV mains, not Mushi League regulars, and they're kind of Smogon guys and Smogon generalists. They're both probably, at their core, Fairy Gen players. Now, that's not to take away you know, Lax in Black White or GSC where he's obviously good or Luthier in any of the other tiers that he plays where he's good, but they are at their core new gen players. And I think Tyros has kind of caught a break in that regard. We're going to have a tight late game here for sure. Uh, the Aerodactyl and the Guard definitely threatening here, but so is the Flygon. Uh, the Milotic potentially could be difficult to break depending on the health that it comes in on. There's obviously that spike down, and any chip that you can get on, it matters. Uh, we've got a, a tight situation here. The spikes are relevant as well. The T-Tar for Tyros is not going to be that great, because all of the Flygon, the Celebi, and the Milotic all outspeed it and can hit it super effectively. So, for example, let's take this turn. If the T-Tar were to stay in, I think Celebi could just outspeed it, click HP Grass, boom, no more. So it's only the Aerodactyl and the Gengar for Tyros, and certainly some amount of nonsense is going to be required here. And it begins. There's a flinch. Going to go for another, but does not get it. But Lax can't kill Aerodactyl from this range without a crit either, so he's going to go for a cover. And there's a flinch, or a crit rather, which is good enough. So now Flygon comes in, who we all know resists Rock. But he's going to be not only crit, but also flinched. He will miss the Rock Slide follow-up, but then Lax will also miss Rock Slide, which is CB, by the way. So that absolutely would have killed him. And all of a sudden, it is Tyros with the Mon's advantage, trying to finish off Milotic. A flinch or crit wins the game there, but neither one happens. There's Recover. Another opportunity. That's going to be a crit. 
Uh, end of flinch. That is yet another crit flinch. He got one against the Flygon just three turns ago, and he gets yet another crit flinch turn against the Milotic here. So obviously some nonsense in this late game. Lax probably favored to win that late game a good, good chunk of the time. Uh, for example, with the Flygon there, if it is not killed by the arrow, if it is not crit flinched by the arrow, the rock slide that comes back, which he did get a chance to do, but he missed, would obviously kill Aerodactyl there since it is CB. And then that would leave us with the Gengar, which can obviously come in and outspeed and kill the Flygon. But then you get Gengar against Milotic. Milo's at full or close to full. And Gengar would have a one-turn window only to land a good roll and a critical hit immediately or a para full para with Thunderbolt. Otherwise, Milo just clicks Surf, Gengar dies, and the game goes to Lax. So a lot of the time, I think Lax is supposed to win this late game. I think he was, I mean, not like 95 to 5, but I think he was fairly significantly favored in this position. And it just didn't work out. Uh, Tyros got a lot of nonsense. There were a lot of flinches in that mix, and he even had two crit flinches, which is exactly, exactly what he would have needed in that spot. So, we are going to move over to game two, but I want to note before we do that, that uh, no player has ever... In the history of play-ins, the whole time we've been doing this, which is dating back to CI 2 or 3, I believe, no player has ever gone undefeated 6-0 through play-ins. We have had the T's a couple times, and we have had multiple players go 6-1 through play-ins, or even make it to the finals of their bracket at 4-0, with the dream still alive, Jabba being one of those players, but it's never worked out. And Tyros, I mean, let's not count the chickens before they hatch, but right now, 3-0 in games, has the opportunity to be the only player in Callus Invitational history to go for the 6-0. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. He's got a 2-0 Lax to do that, and Lax is obviously not going to go down easy. Here is game two. Switch those sides for continuity with Lax on the bottom, Tyros on the top, and again, Tyros dramatically changing it up from his usual. This time, he's got a Venusaur lead, which I could tell you immediately would not be on a special offense team. Uh, the two teams that immediately come to mind when I see lead Venusaur are the old-school linear curve team that he topped ladder with, and that subsequently has been used a bazillion times in a lot of ADV tours since it is a years-old team at this point, uh, with Fori and Tar and Swampert and Blissey and Aerodactyl. I played against that team myself in SPL, actually, so that really tells you how long ago it was. It's been quite a few years. And then the other team that comes to mind is the Vapakuno version with the lead Venusaur, which has, like, Charizard in the back and is way more offense-oriented. That's like Gyarados Charizard kind of nonsense. So it could be that as well. Uh, it's certainly not the linear team anymore because it doesn't have a Metagross. This sequence is interesting. I don't know that I love the way that Tyros played that. Uh, what happens more often than not is he eventually misses Celebi at full health, then switches out to a water, and it's not that great. Uh, alternatively, at any time, Lax could have switched to something like a Magneton, which he doesn't seem to have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Tyros, eh, fuck all that. I'll just I'll just crit eventually. And indeed, that's what happened. Now, it does end up being a trade with the Doug Trio, so going to be a 5-5 situation. And this is a weird team for Lax as well. I vaguely recognize this team. I believe this is an extra shine creation. Uh, this is not something I've actually seen in action, but I think somebody, Sprinkles or ABR, somebody told me about this team. Uh, that was a snipe and a half for Tyros, not only correctly predicting the Doug Trio coming in there, but also getting yet another relevant crit. So Tyros, for sure, has caught in a few relevant pieces of hacks thus far in this series. Flinches, crits, hell, how about both at the same time? Uh, the crits have definitely mattered. The, the crit that killed the Celebi mattered, the crit that killed Doug Trio there mattered. 
It's going to make this game closer than it possibly otherwise could be. Now Lax is getting a little bit of nonsense back with his own crit, but looking at it from the outside, it definitely feels like Tyros has been on the better end of the hacks up to this point, but things could turn very quickly, and there is a 10% Thunderbolt para right on time. Not clear what this Rachi is. We've only seen Combine Thunder. He hasn't even tried to use Wish, so I assume... That it is a substitute Rachi. It could just be CM3 attacks. But I think very likely it is CM, uh, Thunder, probably Ice Punch, but whatever attacking move. And substitute never did get to see the sub. He did have a chance early on to do it and chose not to if that's the case. But after that, he didn't really have a lot of chances. I do agree with Lax going immediately to Porygon 2 here. Generally a pretty good uh, pretty good check against any set of Salamence. It's just one of those generalist counters, just like my Lotic, that can handle just about anything that Immense could throw at it. And here comes CM, and Magneton that does not have Toxic, which evidently this one does not, is a pretty good Mon to set up on. The Magneton really not much of a threat. It is realistic to set up some combines here, though I do like Ice Beam there twice in a row, checking to make sure Salamence does not come in for free. Here's an obvious soft boil turn. Can he pull the trigger? He cannot. Lax went for the check twice, but did not have the balls to go for it a third time. Had he made that decision, he would have sniped the Salamence and killed it there, but it's a missed opportunity for him, and that's going to leave us in still a 4-3, to three, now a 4-2 to two situation, with ne uh, Lax nevertheless in the lead, but an unrevealed in the back for Tyros, which if it were something like a DD Tar, for example, would be a massive threat. Or with the fact that Lax's squad is mostly or entirely, we don't know with the Jirachi, but mostly or entirely special based. Uh, I think something like a Curse Rest Lax, which it's not going to be, but if it were, I think that would be monstrous in the back. But as it turns out, it is Suicune, and he gets off to the right start by blocking Thunder Wave with Sub. Here comes Bliss, and he's going to come mind up, so... Not the greatest odds to get there in this case, but there is a chance. I, I don't agree, and I remember when I did this live, I don't agree with the way that Tyros plays this late game. Uh, after the initial combine, he just spams Ice Beam, fishing for a freeze over and over and over again. I think the better way to play this was to combine up to max and then just fish for a crit. The damage here is so negligible to the Blissey, and even if you get the freeze, she can just switch out, and it's not that big of a deal, because at the time, he only had the one Calm Mind. He's now starting to Calm Mind up, but I think that should have been the play all along. You just Calm Mind up to max, then you start firing shots, and you simply hope that you crit her. But now, with it having not been played that way, kind of in a dire spot, Ice Beam crits there, and so does Thunderbolt, but it makes you wonder with that Ice Beam crit... Had he boosted initially, and had it been a surf crit rather than an, an ice cream, uh, an ice beam crit, I said ice cream. <laughs> hey, ice beam plus crit equals ice cream. I'm gonna let myself have a pass for that one. But had he come mind up initially, and had the surf crit rather than ice beam, could this outcome be different? Maybe a surf crit wouldn't kill her, but it might set you up to kill her on the following turn. Uh, the fact that this game had no sand makes both the Blissey and the Suicune significantly bulkier, and it's not super common that you play a totally sandless game, but that happens to be the case here. Weird-ish teams for both, certainly from Lax's end. Uh, but with that, the the potential of the 6-0 dream has been ruined, has been shattered. There is not going to be a 6-0 from Tyros here, but that is probably totally acceptable should he go on to win his bracket and get in the main event either way. I think that would be a fine, fine consolation prize for the sorrow of not getting the 6-0 record. So Lax for the second round in a row, and Tyros for the first time, is going to be off to a Game 3, and it's going to be do or die in these single elimination play-ins. One of them is going to be in the finals of the Magma Bracket to face the winner of Kulum and Sadly Seas, and the other is going to be eliminated. Here's game three. Switch one more time for continuity. Lax again is on the bottom. Tyros again is on the top. 
As we discussed, every time we have a T-Tar and Mintz lead situation, they are both threatening to each other. Could be something like CB Brick Break and could just as easily be something like Ice Beam on the return. Neither player is comfortable with the matchup, so we end up with bulky waters for both. Pert and Kuhn, and obviously Sweet Kuhn has the advantage in that matchup. Tyros here with seemingly a physical offense team. Once again, five games in play-ins has not touched his dearly beloved special offense spam a single time. Has dedicated himself to changing it up and playing something else, and indeed, that's what he's done yet again. He's going to surprise Lax with a rest here from Gyarados. And obviously it's pretty bulky as far as HP. It's got to be max or damn near based on that seismic toss damage. So an unusual set here of Gyarados. Not sure if Lax knows how to handle that. He maybe jokingly, maybe not jokingly, did in fact type in explanation point smog dex Gyarados in the middle of the battle chat. Like I said, might have been joking, might not have been, but seemingly caught off guard by Gyra. Here comes Suicune, and Gyra is going to come into that as well. Uh, unless there is HP Electric, the Gyarados is not in any meaningful danger here. And I guess he knows that because he's going to Dragon Dance up, but it's going to turn out to only be a speed boost after the Intimidate takes away the attack part. Going to get some meaningful chip on the Mence. However, he will eat a Dragon Claw back, and he can't kill the Mence now without a critical hit. So instead... He's going to rest, and Lax is going to choose to stay in and go for the Dragon Claw, which would have killed the Gyarados if he were to go for anything other than rest. So now Bliss comes in. Fire Blast there does miss, but it obviously would not have done a ton, even had it connected. Got a 6-6 game here, and Registeel reappears. Another weird team from Lax. Not clear where he's getting these squads from, but he's not afraid to mix it up a little bit. He does seem to like sturdier, balanced squads, as is often the case with the generically good Smogon player trying to play ADV. So I'm not surprised that this is his style, but he is within that style, mixing it up a bit. And certainly, last game was something funky, so I applaud Lax not being super predictable. Here comes CM. And there's a rest. Uh, the Surf last turn, definitely relevant. With the crit, uh, if it had not crit, maybe the Swampert could have stayed in, gotten an Earthquake off with a boost, but didn't play out that way. CM and Thunderbolt going to be in exchange now. Blissey seemingly does not have Seismic Toss, and that is quite relevant here, if so. There's pros and cons both ways. I mean, Seismic Toss can neither crit nor para, and Thunderbolt can randomly get there when it does those things. However, if Blissey does not find crits or powers with Thunderbolt, and really the power only matters if it's at pretty specific times because Kuhn can obviously just rest it away. So if a Thunderbolt crit does not come for Tyros, boy is it going to be difficult to kill the Suicune. And the pressure ability here, absolutely relevant as well. Uh, there are 24 Thunderbolts to begin with after considering PP ups, which if you fire them all at the Suicune is only 12. Man, the Suicune here looks like a poke that Tyros is not having an easy time dealing with. He's trying to pivot around it and get it with Mence, which is CB Mence, by the way. So something very unusual. Usually these days, Crocoon, which is the set that Lax is running, Usually Crocoon these days, and there's the first knockout, by the way, via Pursuit. Let's not miss that. But usually Crocoon these days is modest, whereas it is clearly a bold Crocoon from Lax, which quite rare in modern ADV. Uh, but it has to be in order to be taking CB men's hits as well as it's taking them. It's got to be bold. It's got to be damn near full defense. But yeah, it uh, things have unraveled pretty quickly here. For Tyros, and it's very possible that some or all of the Claydol, the Registeel, and the Lax all have boom on this squad. So that's going to be yet another problem when Tyros is already down two pokes and he's got stuff in front of him that can just click boom and force trades. Not saying that Tyros can't win this game. The Gyarados does look like a legitimate threat potentially here for him. 
But it's going to be a real uphill battle. Lax, I think, pretty clearly in a favorable position right now. That was a decent earthquake. Wonder if he plays around the possibility of a T-Wave or a boom here. He is just going to go aggro again. And it is T-Wave. So, well, I mean, he can rest that away. But it's going to slow him down in the meantime. And there is a boom, which he sniffs out with the Magneton. So, right time to make that play for sure. Intimidate there. Not only lowering the attack of something that we know has Rock Slide. But also blanking Earthquake. Goes to Bliss. It, probably trying to tempt him into going for yet another boom. And that's exactly what happens. So a really, really good sequence there. Even Lax says well played in the battle chat. Uh, you know, for all the things that Tyros does that are perhaps a bit questionable and rough around the edges, in this case... That was a really good five turns or so to set that up and get two different booms off on the Magneton. And he baited that second one perfectly. It gives him a shot. It really does. The, uh, the Gyarados could get there. He's still behind. It's still an uphill battle. But things are a lot closer now than they were a few turns ago. There's Meta coming into a body slam. Power would not be the end of the world because we know that the Blissey has Heal Bell, but obviously wants to avoid that if possible. Meteor Mash there wouldn't have done a lot. A raise could have been relevant, but he's going to miss. And here's Gyra coming into the Suicune, which is choosing not to use Sleep Talk so it can actually wake up. DD on Lax is interesting. It's actually, I noticed this during the live battle as well, as tempting as it is for Lax to just blow up with, with well, Lax to blow up the Lax, but as tempting as it is for him to blow the Snorlax up, he can actually lose to the Blissey potentially, which is really weird because it's not even a sweeper Blissey, but assuming the last move is Ice Beam, which I would believe that it is, he can actually lose to the Blissey if he loses the Lax because obviously the Mance would be just... Easy one hit KO'd by the Ice Beam. Uh, assuming that the Coon comes in and does not get a bunch of boosts off, the Thunderbolt is a legit threat, and the Coon right now is only at half. And then the Cheetar, having shown HP Grass, you can basically rule out that it could ever have Brick Break or Focus Punch here. You know it's going to have Flamethrower because it's going to be completely, completely walled by something like Skarmory if it had, say, Crunch Brick Break as the last two moves. That doesn't exist. Same thing, it can't have, like, Ice Beam Crunch, Ice Beam Brick Break. It just gets walled by Steels. So the last two moves are almost certainly going to be Crunch and Flamethrower. So it's a fully special tar, so that can't beat Blissey either. You know, so as tempting as it is for this Snorlax to just click Self-Destruct and try to take the Gyarados down, and yes, the Gyarados is a threat, as tempting as it is to make that play... It may be ill-advised because the Blissey legit could get there for Tyros. The Gyarados maybe could too. These two, this is an interesting dynamic. Here comes the DD and there's the Surf, which does 26. So there's zero chance that the next Surf gets him without a critical hit. However, the same can be said for Tyros. There's also zero chance that his hidden power, which might happen next turn, gets there without a crit either. So he's going to go for Rest, which is really interesting, actually. If he had had the balls there to click Hidden Power, that would put Lax in a really tough position. I think Lax there uh, really fucked up. I don't like that CM at all. What if Tyrus had just clicked Hidden Power? What do you switch in now? I, I don't like that play at all for Lax. I think that was giving Tyros an opportunity that he didn't need to have. It worked out, but don't love the risk associated with the play. That being said, the crit that Tyros is looking for does not come. Surf takes out the Gyro with the help of the Sand. And Tyros now is going to rely, he's going to have to rely on landing a critical hit to kill this Suicune. And even then, he's going to have the Lax to worry about. So I don't know that the window has completely closed for Tyros, but it has now largely closed. It's going to be very difficult to win. With the Gyarados down, all hope is not lost. He needs to find critical hits with Thunderbolt, and he needs it fast before he runs out of PP via pressure. 
but we're not quite done yet. That is the fifth calm mind. The damage is negligible at this point. Crit or an ice beam freeze going to be necessary. And there's a rest to get rid of the freeze possibility or the para. Neither of those are relevant here. It simply has to be a critical hit now. And he can't blow Metagross on it either because that would leave him with only Blissey. And that would absolutely lose one-on-one -on -one to the Lax, whether it is Boom Lax, Boom Lax or Rest Lax. And I think it's Boom, but either way, Blissey would lose. So blowing up Meta on the Coon is not an option here. Has to get there with Bliss. There's the Wake and the Rest. That play I agree with. And there's a crit, but... How many Thunderbolts does he really have left? This says 11, but it's got to be way less than that because of pressure. Meta comes in and prays that he comes in on something other than Surf, which is the case. Suicune is faster here, but Lax is not willing to risk it. He's going to fodder off Titar. Leaves us in a 3-2 situation. Salamence on Meta. Here comes Bliss. And Wish there, got to be careful. He could pass that to either of the other pokes or try to keep it for himself. Gonna try to pass to Kuhn. And Tyros, who may be out of Thunderbolts, can't stop it. So he's going to have to rely on finding a mash attack raise here. Sleep Talk finds something relevant in CM. Mash there, 16%. No raise. Really needs an attack raise ASAP here. Still sleeping. And Surf, not what he wants. And MASH does get a raise now, but I think it's too little too late. The damage roll here is going to be really close. It did 43 last time. He's at 44, and it is not quite enough. Damn close, almost, but not quite. And Tyros is not going to drag us through the mud. He knows he's beat, and he's going to concede with a polite GG. So Lax here takes him three games in both of the sets. But he emerges victorious from both over Zern and over Tyros. He's going to be in the Magma Bracket Finals where he will face the yet-to-be-determined winner of Kloom and Sadly Seas. This really was a good series and Tyros really did impress me with the fact that for such a narrow or seemingly narrow player... He was so willing in these plans to completely switch it up. He didn't bring special offense ever for the whole time, all five games. And he dedicated himself to bringing something different every time. I definitely applaud that decision. Uh, he didn't necessarily look fully comfortable with all of the teams that he brought. And there were certainly some mistakes. I think game three in particular probably could have been played better. And there were some opportunities, especially in the late game, to make some different decisions, but there were also, there were flashes of brilliance along the way as well. The boom sequence in particular, where he got two different booms onto the Magneton, one of which he perfectly orchestrated. Uh, that was a flash of brilliance, and that, that's the potential of what the ceiling for Tyros could be. You know, at the end of the day, he's only been playing EDV remotely competitively for something in the vicinity of two years. It may even be a little less, but I think it's about two years, which... Feels like a long time, but like considering that a lot of us have been doing this for half a decade, a decade, more than a decade, two years is actually relatively new as far as ADV is concerned. And even though there won't be any more Callous Invitationals in the future, there's going to be a lot of other tournaments, and the future could be bright for Tyros if he sticks with the game. There's obviously flashes in there, there's obviously potential, just has to work on the consistency and clean some things up. But it really was a pleasure to have you in this tour, Tyros. You were classy and respectful the whole time. Uh, you, you really, you showed that you can hang at this level. You showed that you belong. You didn't get dunked on. Head up high, dude. There's going to be more tours. I wish you the luck going forward. All that said, Lax is the winner. So like I said, he will face Kaloom or Sadly Seas. We'll see who wins that set. It's going to take place tomorrow. But that's going to be the end of the games today, unless someone last minute changes when they're playing one more time i apologize to jabba for the mistake unintentional obviously with the recording earlier today hope you guys aren't too mad about it either doing my best to rectify the situation 
But there's going to be a lot more CI to come, and I will see you guys in those videos. Thank you for watching.